If you've been here every Sunday during August as we have been working on this justice series, you've gotten to know Obi and Nanika and Melanie quite well. They have been our worship leaders. And the reason that we've asked them to be here each week is that they are also the leaders of our justice and outreach team. So when you have an idea of something wonderful to do or you see an injustice and you would like for us to be involved in that, they're the people for you to contact. They have been wonderful worship leaders. They'll worship lead again next week and I hope you will get to know them at coffee hour and in the days to come. A couple of weeks ago, we had our first sermon table talk at my house. I've always loved having a group of people help me think through the scriptures and themes of worship. At our first attempt at First Church, we had a wonderful time and it did not disappoint. We had a great conversation about this series, Everyday Justice, and how it was working on our souls and helping us to think more deeply about how our everyday choices have a global impact. We looked at the scriptures for each week and I didn't realize until I started working on this sermon that I'd given them the wrong scripture for today. So earlier this week, I sent them the right scripture and asked them to weigh in on what they saw and heard in this parable from the Gospel of Luke. As much as I enjoyed our time around the table, I absolutely loved the email conversation that ensued with the new scripture. Their responses were thoughtful and eye-opening. It was evident each person had taken time to really think through this parable, and they were able to relate this passage to our world and to their lives. The connections we made in my backyard have grown even deeper as we continued this conversation. The parables of Jesus, according to the scholar John Dominic Croson, were meant to make people think. Croson imagines these conversations with Jesus taking some time, he says maybe an hour or more. And rather than being a one-sided process with Jesus speaking and the people listening, the parables produced a conversation between Jesus and the people. Croson even imagines the people talking back to Jesus, interrupting, debating, disagreeing, and even fighting with him. No fist fights, mind you, but that kind of fighting that happens when we have our strongly held perspectives questioned. The parable you heard today is not an easy parable to listen to. It's a parable that we would like to read but not discuss because it makes us uncomfortable. It makes us think about our choices. It makes us think about our lifestyles. And yes, this parable is totally capable of producing some good old guilt. Last week, the choir sang a piece about greed. It reminded me of a sermon I gave long ago titled, Why Can't Greed Be Good? Life would be so much easier if greed were a virtue rather than a vice. If I only had to think about myself, then decisions could be made very quickly. If I only had to worry about my having enough, my choices would be simple. If I didn't have to be concerned if something was fair or not, life would just be so much easier. Remember when you were a kid and you had a candy bar? and your parent asks you to share it with your sibling. How many of you worked hard to break that candy bar exactly in half? Ah, no hands, I see. How many of you worked hard to break it two-thirds and one-third and make the one-third look like half? <laughs> The problem is, now that we're grown up, we aren't dividing up candy. We're dividing natural resources and wealth and power, and we're doing it without giving these practices a single thought. 
We live in a culture, in a society, in a place and time where selfishness and greed are now considered a virtue. And the more selfish and the more greedy we become, the more we are admired. The man from the parable may have been an oddity in the historical context of time when Jesus told this parable, but not for the crowd that day because it must have hit close to home. I remember a time when being generous and giving to help those who were in need was a virtue. I remember a time when we all looked up to people who led the way in philanthropic efforts. People used to have their names put on buildings because they had given a great deal of money to a worthy cause. These days, big names are on big buildings to show how much money we have and how powerful we are. And yet it is so easy to let this parable be about the 1% and not about all of us. The parable, though, does resemble so many of us these days. And even though few of us are building bigger barns to keep our grain in, most of us have accumulated a lot of stuff. My mother hated that word. She'd really hate it that I'm using it in this sermon, but we'll move on. We don't need most of that stuff, but we can't let go. These days, we're being told there is a remedy out there to help us all deal with this stuff. In case you don't know who she is, Marie Kondo is a tidying expert, a best-selling author, and the star of Netflix hit show, Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. Her number one New York Times best-selling book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, has taken tidying to a whole new level. In the book, she explains that if you properly simplify your life and organize your home once, you will never have to do it again. She doesn't advocate for a room-by-room approach or a little-by-little approach because most of us, she argues, will be doomed to picking away at our piles of stuff forever. Now that could be a convincing description of hell. Her method encourages instead tidying by category, not by location. And if you haven't heard of her, you need to run home this afternoon and watch an episode of her show or find her information. But make sure that you're ready. I knew nothing about her and was totally unprepared. I almost hyperventilated watching the one episode I could stand. I will admit I have not become a Marie Kondo groupie. If you come by my new office, you'll know how true that really is. I do, though, like her philosophy about what to let go of and what to keep. She says only those things that speak to our hearts should be kept. How many of your possessions speak to your heart? This series is about changing habits, about making everyday choices that can impact the world. Yet these good choices will only be temporary if we don't change our habits and if we don't change our hearts. A few years ago, I began to realize that some of my possessions had started possessing me. When we sold the large house we had built and moved to a much smaller row house in the historic district outside of Washington, I was able to let go of a lot. But that townhouse had a garage, a single garage, mind you, But you have no idea how much stuff I could pack into a single car garage. I still vividly remember the day that our son helped me get rid of all that stuff. We had to get rid of all that stuff because we had to actually start using the garage for a car. Such a novel idea. Our reserved parking places were going away and one of our cars had to fit in there. It was grueling to go through those boxes, but we did it. And there was a sense of freedom 
in finally letting go of so much. The only thing I still remember that we got rid of was one of those old hand crank ice cream freezers. It had been with us forever, and occasionally I do still miss it. It was a few months later I heard a talk by someone who said, giving away things you want, you don't want or don't need anymore is good. But giving away something you treasure, that is when real growth and joy in your life can begin. In the scriptures, there are several passages that remind us where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. As I thought about this sermon this week, I shared with some of our staff something I gave away over 20 years ago, something that I still carry in my heart. It was a gift that meant so much to me. But the time came when someone needed it more than I did. And I wish I could tell you I never regretted giving it away. But that's not the truth. I read an article this week from a Buddhist teacher I follow. In the article, she talked about cleaning. Marie Kondo, she is not. But she suggested that each time you clean out a closet or a drawer or any place where you have stashed stuff, that you find five things to give away. She cleans until she finds five things that she can part with. Some of them go straight in the garbage. Others find their way to the recycling center or a thrift shop. Yet others serviceable and wonderful but of no immediate use, she passes along to friends. So many presents, so many new discoveries, so much trash. I think letting go of things is a virtue. I think letting go of things reminds us it is not all about us. When we open our hands and let things go that we've been holding on to, the possibility of becoming more generous people actually has a chance. And when we start letting go of things, we begin to think about the car we drive and the food we eat and the clothes we wear. We begin to realize that what we do, how we spend our money, where we place our investments, it all matters so much. So deep breath. Your homework this week is to find five things and let go of them. Those five things can go in the trash or they can be recycled. You can send them to a thrift shop. You can give them to a friend. And then the Buddhist teacher will be happy with you. But I'm asking you to do something a little different. I hope this week that one of those five things will be something you treasure. I can't promise you won't regret it. But you may be amazed at how it will begin to help you open your hands and let go. Once we begin letting go, those things that the earth need us to do, that the children of the world need from us, that virtue and goodness and generosity need us to understand will start to appear. And it won't be hard to practice everyday justice. Everyday justice will simply be who we are. May it be so. Amen.